you and uh, thank you for inviting me to address this audience this morning. This is, I know, an important gathering which brings together many people with significant understandings of the issues which the Royal Commission uh, is considering. Uh, I regret to say that I have more commitments in Brisbane today and I won't be able to stay with you throughout the day's events. When the Prime Minister Julia Gillard announced in November 2012 that she intended to recommend the appointment of a Royal Commission to investigate the responses of institutions to the sexual abuse of children, no one had any realistic idea of the size of the task and the time that would be necessary to complete it. There was an understanding that the problem was significant but the number of people who may wish to give an account of their personal circumstances and the number of institutions which may be involved was unknown. The letters patent for the Commission were issued in January 2013. They recognised the difficulties in defining the task and for that reason they require the Commission to provide an interim report to government by 30 June this year. In that report, we must recommend the date which should be fixed for the submission of a final report. Although the terms of reference actually contemplate that the final report should be delivered not later than 31 December 2015, this was always recognised to be unlikely to be achieved. When the Prime Minister announced the appointment of the Commissioners of the Royal Commission, she said that the terms of reference to set an end date for the Royal Commission of 31 December 2015, but that date can be extended if necessary. It takes time to put in place the people and the facilities necessary to conduct an inquiry on the scale of this Royal Commission. I have spoken previously about the resources we needed before we could accept people's stories. A priority has been the well-being of survivors who accept the trauma involved in recounting, possibly for the first time, the awful experience which scarred them as a child and may have left them with lifelong psychological disabilities and other continuing problems. We have now received the stories of more than 1,730 people in private session. There are another 1,000 people who have already been accepted for a private session. We continue to receive requests for private sessions at the rate of 40 per week. We have also received more than 1,650 written accounts from people who generally have not been to a private session. When we commenced our work, we were told that there were many people who would be cautious about contacting the Commission. They would prefer to wait and see whether they could trust our processes before they came forward. We are now receiving calls from people who tell us they have watched the Commission, followed its public hearings, and listened to others who have come to talk to us. Now that they understand the nature of the Commission and trust our processes, they feel safe in telling us their story. We can expect that as confidence grows, many more people will come forward. Our program of private sessions is ongoing in every capital city and in some regional and remote centres. In recent weeks, we commenced to conduct private sessions within the prison system. A commissioner has also travelled to northwestern Australia to conduct private sessions. Our engagement with the prison system and in places outside of the main population centres will continue. However, it is not possible to identify how many people will want to talk to us from these locations. By 31 May 2014, we have held a total of 12 public hearings. They have been held in Adelaide, 
Brisbane, Perth and Sydney. There have been 96 hearing days and there have been 219 witnesses. Another hearing is continuing in Canberra uh, as we meet here this morning. By June 2014, the end of this month, we will have completed 21 research projects. We anticipate that we, we will have completed 52 research projects by the end of 2015. And I know that some of you in this room know a great deal about some of those projects. By the end of this month, we will have released seven issues papers. We have already received 300 submissions in response to the first five. And if there are people here who have played a part in those responses, can I ex express the Commissioner's gratitude for the response which has come to us from academics, government, uh, institutions and the broader community. They are of immense value to the work that we are doing. We held the first community roundtable in April this year and that focused on out of home care the second round table will look at working with children checks, uh, which I will chair in Canberra uh, next Monday. By the end of last month, we had issued 643 notices or summonses to produce, and we have received more than 400,000 documents in response to those notices. We have also issued 246 notices to uh, witnesses, to people to appear and give evidence before the Commission. Uh, I can go on talking numbers, but you may be interested to know that we've had 13,500 phone calls and we've received 5,500 pieces of correspondence. Uh, you may be interested to know that I have referred under the powers given to me under the Act, more than 160 matters for investigation by the police in various states in Australia. As the government originally contemplated, it is now possible for us to identify the task or the tasks which we must complete to effectively respond to the letters pattern. When developing our plan, we have been careful to reflect the essential obligations in the letters patent. They stress that it is important that claims of systemic failures by institutions in relation to allegations and incidents of child sexual abuse be fully explored and that best practice is identified. Further, they state that it is important that those affected by child sexual abuse can share their experiences to assist with healing and to inform the, de the development of strategies and reforms. The letters patent require us to make recommendations about policy, legislative, administrative and structural reforms. Since we began our work, we have received allegations of abuse from people in more than 1,000 institutions. It has been suggested to us by some people that the problems we are looking at are all historical. They happened in the past and are unlikely to occur today. And I've heard those sorts of discussions where well, they've been reported to me on Talkback Radio, uh, often with people who uh, uh, have a significant role to play in the community. An analysis of the institutions reported to us in private sessions confirms that although it is possible that the level of abuse has diminished, the reality is that the potential remains. Because private sessions are conducted with people who self-report, care should be taken before using the analysis I'm about to refer to for statistical purposes. However, it is informative and provides a contemporary context for sexual abuse allegations. 32% of the institutions reported to us can be described as either an industrial school, 
a training school, a reformatory, an orphanage or a children's home. Some of the children in these facilities would have been part of the child migra migration program which occurred generally in the th uh, third quarter of the last century. Others would have been, other children would have been born out of wedlock and because of the cultural norm of that time, surrendered to institutional care. It can be assumed that with the cessation of these programs and the widespread use of contraception and more accepting social attitudes, the risk to children in the circumstances of the schools and similar institutions I referred to um, has been removed. However, with the closure of orphanages and similar residential institutions for children, the problems which children previously faced when living in dysfunctional families or without effective care from a parent or guardian have not disappeared. Many of those children will today find their way into out-of-home care. Others of them who have encountered difficulties with the justice system will end up in some form of detention. Those children remain vulnerable to abuse, although in a different institutional setting or context. Apart from that first group, there are three other types of institution which are subject to high levels of complaint in the reports we have received in private sessions. 30% of our private sessions have been conducted, that's 30% have been conducted with people who were abused in a school or in another form of educational setting. 16% have told us they were abused in a place of worship in a church youth group or in a seminary. About 8% report abuse in out of home care. The balance of those coming to us in private session <coughs> report abuse in a variety of circumstances including childcare, sporting groups, healthcare and juvenile justice. We can assume that the number of children in childcare both daycare and after school care will have con increased in recent years and uh, I uh, am sure is going to increase further in the years to come. Uh, knowing of that uh, matter uh, or our knowledge of that matter was one of the reasons why uh, the one, uh, uh, earliest or the second hearing we did was the hearing into the YMCA, which is a very large provider of after-school care. The balance of those coming to us in private sessions <coughs> report, oh, I've told you, abuse in various circumstances. It is obvious <coughs> that in any institution which has responsibility for children, there is a risk of sexual abuse. As I've said, it is only the child migrant children and children born out of wedlock who are no longer in institutions. All of the other institutions and accordingly opportunities for abuse remain. Some types, <coughs> excuse me, some types of institutions, in particular out of home care, and child daycare and after school care have increased in number over recent years. Because it takes on average more than 20 years for people to report abuse, in some cases significantly longer, it is wrong to assume that abuse of children in an institutional context is a problem of the past. The task of the Royal Commission is to identify appropriate recommendations to respond to a problem which, although of necessity, describe, is described by past events, it must respond to future risks. I have described on previous occasions the care with which the Royal Commission 
selects institutions to be considered in a public hearing. Although some must be, in, must be hearings in relation to institutions which have ceased to exist, many are not. We have conducted public hearings into the Scouts, the YMCA, three schools, two diocesan churches and the Salvation Army. All of these institutions continue to exist. The risk of abuse accordingly remains. We will continue to select public hearings where we can develop issues of present relevance and develop contemporary responses. Faith-based institutions, whether residential facilities, schools or diocesan, constitute a significant proportion of the institutions reported to us by survivors. Many of these are Catholic institutions. Although we will look at a representative sample of all institutions in public hearings, it is inevitable that there will be multiple Catholic institutions which must be considered. You may be aware of the recent statements by Vatican spokesmen and the Pope in relation to the sexual abuse of children. To further our inquiries into the response of the Catholic Church to offending priests and religious in Australia, I have written to Cardinal Teruzio Batoni, the Secretary of State of the Vatican City, seeking a copy of all documents held in Rome relating to complaints of sexual abuse by priests or religious. We have asked for copies of documents which reveal the nature and extent of communications between Catholic congregations in Australia and the Holy See. We have to date received some documents which are relevant to the public inquiry which will occur shortly in respect of the Catholic Diocese of Wollongong. I am awaiting a reply in relation to my general request. From these documents, we should be able to determine how church authorities in Australia, under the guidance or direction of the Vatican, have responded to individual allegations of abuse. <coughs> One of the many difficult questions which the Royal Commission is considering is why does abuse occur? Or more directly, why does a person become an abuser? A variety of views, and uh, some of you in this audience, of course, know more about the issue than I, but a variety of views have been expressed. It is unclear to me whether we will ever be able to satisfactorily answer the question. However, we will identify and consider the theories which involve the structure of institutions and the profile of individuals who have authority within them in an endeavour to provide an answer to the important question. The issue is compounded by the fact that we know that the majority of abuse happens in a familial or other domestic context. That may be merely a product of numbers. Most children live with a family but it suggests that matters other than the fact of the institution are important. There are people who suggest that the obligation of celibacy increases the risk that a person will be an abuser. Some senior clerics have acknowledged in evidence to the Royal Commission that this is an issue which should be considered. It may also be that familial abuse is predominantly a male assaulting a female, which is occasioned by different factors to a male assaulting a boy in an entirely male environment. These are all complex issues which we must consider. <coughs> it is already clear that the work we are doing is having a significant impact upon the way institutions operate and respond to the sexual abuse of children. And I suspect that the fact that we exist may have played a small part in the size of the audience here this morning. Some of our understanding about how institutions operate and respond um, 
or have operated and do respond comes from evidence in public hearings and we also have various uh, uh, other people who have brought information to us about what is now happening in the institutional community. The public hearing into the YMCA carrying bar has brought a response <coughs> from both the YMCA and other childcare groups. <coughs> we understand YMCA is reviewing its employment and management procedures, both in New South Wales and elsewhere. We also understand that after hearing of the YMCA's problems, many other childcare providers are reviewing their own practices, learning from the difficulties exposed at the YMCA and failures which enabled abuse to occur. As you know, we have conducted public hearings into segments of the Catholic uh, and Anglican churches. In those public hearings, church leaders have both acknowledged past failures and promised to reconsider the institution's response, including the monetary payments made to individual survivors. The Salvation Army has responded in the same way. I'll come back to those issues in a moment. We have now examined three schools in public hearings. In each of these, significant problems of abuse have been identified. It has been reported to us that as a consequence, many schools are reviewing their own employment and management practices, and where weaknesses are identified, appropriate changes are being made. There are many other issues which we are considering through investigation, research and consultation. The criminal and civil justice systems, working with children procedures, what makes an institution safe for children and problems in out-of-home care are but some of those issues. By the end of 2015, we estimate that having regard to the other work which we must complete, we will have been able to conduct only 40 public hearings. From the information we have collected, we have concluded there, that there are at least 30 more institutions which must be examined in a public hearing if we are to fulfil the obligation in the letters patent. Beyond the investigation of particular institutions, we believe we should also conduct public hearings to review <coughs> responsive institutions which have already been subject to a hearing. We will go back and look again at the YMCA to identify whether an effective response is being made to the problems which have been revealed. We will look at others that we've examined already in public hearing. Go back again. We will also conduct hearings in which we discuss with a number of institutions their individual responses to common problems. Many survivors have told us of their experience when they complained of their abuse to the institution in which it occurred. Some institutions have developed a formalised process for their response. Others address these issues in an ad hoc fashion. In some states, redress schemes, which include modest monetary payments, have also been developed. However, they are not universal. Providing an appropriate response and redress to a person who has been abused raises many complex issues. A number of institutions have recognised the need to review the response which they have made to people in the past. However, they are hesitant to move forward without understanding the recommendations which the Royal Commission may make in this area. Notwithstanding the complexities of the task, we recognise the need to address these problems at the earliest possible date. We have developed a program which will allow us to identify the issues, collect relevant information and provide recommendations. We are seeking to publish, to publish our conclusions and recommendations on this issue by the middle of next year. Consultations have already commenced uh, to discern the attitude of various bodies to changes in these areas. <coughs> Some of you <coughs> will be aware of the complexities involved 
in this issue. It is common for institutions to recognise the need to separate any pastoral response to a survivor from any process which provides monetary redress or compensation. Institutions which have responded by offering money have generally also been the decision maker as to the amount which should be provided. Such a process is burdened by a fundamental conflict. That conflict is evidence in some schemes where a cap is placed on the maximum payment which can be made. Although a redress scheme may reasonably need a cap, if it is imposed arbitrarily by the institution responsible for the payment, it can be difficult for a survivor to accept that the process is other than token and insincere. Survivors generally identify three fundamental elements of an effective redress scheme. Many people, the overwhelming majority of people, seek an apology from the institution and sometimes from the abuser, which acknowledges and accepts responsibility for the harm done to them. Um, those two words are important, acknowledge and accepts responsibility. They need the institution to accept that a member of that institution inflicted great harm and has caused great suffering. Many survivors have a need for effective and ongoing counselling provided by appropriately qualified professionals. This comes at a cost, particularly where in some cases counselling is necessary for years or decades. Survivors understandably look to the institutions to meet that cost. Apart from suffering per personal health issues, many survivors' lives have been seriously compromised in other ways. In some cases, the damage is so great that they have never been able to complete an education, establish satisfactory personal relationships and provide the security of a home and other basics of life. The process by which the sexual abuse of a child can seriously damage the personal development of the individual may not be fully understood. However, it is clear beyond argument that in some people this will occur. To help with these difficulties, many survivors seek a monetary payment. For some, it brings an acknowledgement of the failure of the institution, but for others, it reflects a need for financial assistance to sustain their lives. There are many other issues which the Royal Commission must address. They are discussed in the interim report, which will be provided to the various governments, remembering we are seven Royal Commissions, not one, uh, by 30 June, or on 30 June this year. The Commissioners look forward to engaging with both individuals and institutions throughout the country to develop recommendations which will achieve the objective of making our institutions safer places for children. And I welcome the meeting here today and uh, look forward to reports in due course of the discussions uh, which you will have. Thank you very much for inviting me this morning and Thank you for holding these proceedings. Thank you.